welcome you to the Q&A Cafe uh, and start by thanking our sponsors, um, the Amano Shop, uh, Georgetown Cupcake, um, Nancy Taylor Bubis at Washington Fine Properties. Um, I think that's it for, uh, for this week's show, but I'm grateful to all of them. And I'm very grateful to have Ken Gormley here. We're going to be talking about um, Ken's book, The Death of American Virtue, The Death of American Virtue. And um, you want to get it. You want to, you want to get it, and you want to get it for your friends, too. And I'm not just talking to the people in the audience. I'm talking to all of you in the room here. I, I always believe don't buy one, buy two or three, because you're going to want to give it away. Here, do you want to take Thank you. Thank you, Bill. I'm glad you're here. Uh, but welcome, Ken. It's good to have you Thank here. You, Remember Carol. your microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, to, uh, welcome to Washington. Welcome to the Q&A Cafe. Um, January 1998. Where were you? What were you doing? When the Monica when the, Lewinsky yeah. story what broke. What was it, January 17th? It was a Wednesday. It was the 21st, I believe, okay. Carol. And you, I you, remember, would, you would know. <laughs> I remember walking out the door to get my newspaper on the stoop and opening, opening it up and almost falling over. This was the biggest story I had followed because I had written the biography of Archibald, Archibald Cox, Cox right. the Watergate special prosecutor. I had followed all of the... Whitewater, Paula Jones uh, issues, but this was bigger than anything anyone could imagine, and it made no sense that all of a sudden Ken Starr, who had been investigating the Whitewater matter and that was yeah. almost done, was suddenly investigating whether or not President Clinton, Clinton had had sexual relations with a young intern. But you were probably one of the very few people actually thinking about Ken Starr at that moment. I think most people were thinking, what? <laughs> How could this happen? Well, uh, and interestingly, I was also one of the first people called by the newspapers because my book had, had just come out. On Cox. Well, and where were you? What I wanted to know was where were you living? What were you oh, doing? Well, I was in Pittsburgh doing what I do now, which is teaching in law school at Duquesne University okay. School of Law. I teach constitutional law. Right. And I was one of the first people called by the New York Times when this happened because of my work on special prosecutors and Archibald Cox, and they asked me what I thought of this, and I was the first person to question, or one of the first to question, whether Ken Starr had jurisdiction to mm -hmm. go into the Monica Lewinsky case, because I knew from Archibald Cox's story that special prosecutors have a very specific charter right. that they have to operate under, and this did not fit under that charter. Well, but people people were not fixated on Ken Starr yet. At the very right. at the very beginning of this saga, the the Ken Starr focus only only a few insiders really had any kind of beat on True. Ken Starr at that point. But um, but for everybody else, it was it was a shock. It was it was a huge shock. And what's interesting about your book, though, your book doesn't begin there. Your book is very interesting, and in, I think, and that at least for me, and that it took it takes the reader back to the very roots of Ken Starr and Bill Clinton. And and I and I'd kind of like to start there a little bit because it was I didn't realize how much they had in common. Right. Will you talk about that a little bit? Sure. I didn't realize it either. And I was, uh, I begin the book in one of the early chapters talking about their upbringings. And they were very, very similar people. They had been born. Same state? Uh, well, within uh, Arkansas and Texas, within a couple of hundred yeah, miles. Of each other. Uh, with, within a month of each other, literally. Oh, that's right. mm -hmm. And they were both from strong southern religious families, but with slightly different tilts. And so right. Bill Clinton become, goes to the top of the profession in politics. Ken Starr is one of the youngest federal judges and then solicitors general of the United States right. at the top of his profession. And they end up in this collision. And it is tragic, really, Carol, because uh, I spent a lot of time in Arkansas talking to friends of President Clinton since he was a child mm -hmm. and his mother's best friends. I spent time in Texas where Ken Starr grew up. These were both very good people who somehow ended up in this train wreck. Well, it was interesting for me how you take us um, into Whitewater, which is really where the story does begin, because Whitewater led to, got entangled with Paula Jones, and then somehow Monica gets tangled in with Paula Jones. Right. But it starts with Whitewater. It starts with the McDougals. Right. 
And right off the bat, you, you, you sort of um, answered a question I've always had, which was what was the relationship of Susan McDougall and Bill Clinton? And you pretty much, um, you, you don't attribute this to anybody, you just say they had an affair. They did have an affair, and I can't uh, disclose my sources, but I can say that they did have an affair, a brief affair during the time that President Clinton was governor of Arkansas. What was the status of the whole Whitewater development and, um, and the Clinton's involvement in Whitewater when McDougal was having this affair? Oh, that was Clinton? virtually dead. You have to understand, Whitewater became a kind of code word for everything Crazy Everything else. That, went ha right. that happened in Arkansas involved Jimmy McDougal. But that deal was long gone. That was done. The Clintons had little or no involvement in that. It really became now what did become front and center was Jim McDougal's savings and loan misadventures uh, using Madison Guarantee to try to bail out Whitewater. The Clintons, I concluded, had nothing to do with that. Didn't know about any of that. But it does. What does become interesting, Carol? So uh, if you're suggesting. Did was there somehow this relationship enter into whether Susan McDougal? I went just home? wondered where their relationship fell in the timeline. Yeah, if it was concurrent with scandal already being no. beginning to attach. To Absolutely not. It was it was while things were still rolling along, and the Jim McDougal was involved more in the mm -hmm. SNL business, which the Clintons didn't even know. And their marriage was. Uh, was it already on the rocks at that point? Jim and Susan McDougall, yeah. at this point, their marriage had really deteriorated. He was having mental problems. He had, uh, you know, was, was beginning to lose a lot of his, his uh, empire, his financial empire. And in the middle of this, he runs for Congress. Susan mm -hmm. McDougall told me he was manic depressive and was just bouncing up and down. And he also ended up using medications, I think, excessively. But it, it really was a sad story because Jim McDougall, although he, by his own admission, I found documents in his lawyer's papers that he admitted he was an alcoholic at age 15, he was a person that everyone respected in Arkansas. Bill Clinton liked and respected, but his life just bottomed out. Did you know when you started the book that it would begin with um, essentially Jim McDougall and end with him? What a great question. No, I did not. And in fact, I thought I was going to start with the Monica Lewinsky piece of things, because that's, of course, what most people were fascinated with. Well, it works out as such a marvelous high point as you're reading right. that I can But um, uh, it was th be, uh, talking to people like David Kendall, President Clinton's mm -hmm. lawyer, and people on both sides of the, the aisle here who told me that you really could not understand any of this that led to the impeachment of President Clinton without understanding Whitewater. It turned out that was absolutely correct. You could not understand this story without the Whitewater piece of it. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that uh, you, you, you build, you build. And um, by the time everybody ends up in that hotel room in, in Pentagon City, you know so many of all the players right. that you, you, feel, you feel like you're there. But we're not there yet. Uh, you, you take everybody to uh, Little Rock with the Clintons, and then you bring the Clintons to Washington, and you, you take the reader through the mini scandal of the travel office, right. which had, had sort of faded from memory as I was right. reading through it, and then it all came back. And then, of course, and you go into such uh, detail that I'd not read before about Vince Foster in his last days. It's a very sad story. It is. And this was a man who never, ever really engaged here. He never, he never was meant to be here. And it, it, maybe he had the frailties before he arrived, but they were the kinds of frailties that Washington just consumes. Yeah. And he had no place to go with them. He was not the kind of personality who could share them. But you talked to a lot of people who really walked you through his last days. And um, what was that like for you? To, had you ever met Vince Foster? Was he? No, I never met Vince Foster. Um, I did talk to people who were very close to him. As you know, there were stories of conspiracies oh, yeah. by the Clintons to murder Vince Foster. And what I wanted to show here was, first of all, not only was there not a shred of evidence that this was anything other than a suicide, and both Ken Starr and his predecessor, Robert Fisk, concluded that after extensive investigations, 
But here was the piece that was so troubling to me, Carol. I interviewed uh, Bill Kennedy, who was one of his close friends, who also came from the Rose Law Firm, along with Hillary Clinton, Webb Hubble, uh, Vince. And he was the person who had the grim task yes. of going to the morgue to identify Vince's body. Never talked about this before. And frankly, this was the one, one of the most difficult questions as a writer. Do I ask him to tell me about that? And I finally called I that. I thought it was a very important part of the book. Yeah, it was, because I wanted people to see all of these uh, stories about conspiracies and everything. This was Bill Clinton's best friend since the time he was yeah. in kindergarten, and Bill Kennedy's. And so this was a shock to them and to Hillary Clinton. It was, if you can picture your, one of your best friends and this happening and the grief you're going through, and on top of that to layer on allegations that they were involved in it, it was grotesque, frankly, and it was a very sad piece of the well, story. Well, that's where the book steps outside of your, you know, just sort of uh, fundamental history and has a very human dimension to it. Uh, I thought the way you just travel with Clinton from the, you know, he's in the middle of doing an interview. He, uh, Mac McCarty right. pulls him aside, McClarty pulls him aside and tells him the news. Um, he ends up leaving the White House and going over to the Foster's home. Uh, all of that uh, was very moving, but what's, what's really stunning is who's the last person to see Vince Foster alive? Yeah, many people would not know this, but the last person to see him alive in the White House was his secretary, Linda Tripp. Yeah, that's, um, and she had, and she came, she came with the job. She right. was a holdover. She was a civil employee, civ held over from the previous administration from Bush. Right, and I interviewed Linda Tripp several times. Clearly. She's, she's actually a, a very intelligent, likable woman. However, I will say, What's important here, and this is an important piece of the story, is she had developed a dislike of Bill Clinton and a suspicion of him. And you may have seen in the book that she even told me she thought that she was moved from out, her station outside right. the Oval Office upstairs because Hillary was afraid President Clinton might hit on her. Um, so anyway, she I had, shouldn't laugh, but yeah, she had developed this kind of deep suspicion of the Clinton White House and was openly criticizing their handling of the Vince Foster death and of the Whitewater Papers. But did people you talked to say that Linda Tripp was just a busybody even then? I mean, that she had that kind of personality, that she was sticking her nose in other people's business all the time? Well, I think people said that she was a very complicated woman. Again, this is someone who's very smart and accomplished, and if you were to sit down with her, you would find her to be a very likable person. But throughout your book, she's a train wreck. Well. <laughs> She's a, she is a very conflicted woman because on one hand, she was, I think, truly appalled that when she learned that President Clinton, who she already disliked and yeah. distrusted, was having this affair with a young woman the age of her daughter. I think she was genuinely appalled. I think she believed that with this knowledge, she was at risk of some harm herself, whether that was paranoia or otherwise. I think she really did believe that. But in the end, even the grand jurors, if you notice in the scenes where she goes to the grand jury and Monica goes to the grand jury, even the grand jurors weren't buying it in terms of, well, if you cared about this young woman so much, why were you tape recording her conversation? This was a person who never thought about collateral damage. And, right. and I, 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 I'm, I'm going to just jump ahead for a second, but then I wanted to go back. I thought one of the most telling things about Linda Tripp is there they are at the Pentagon City Ritz. Um, and she's just sort of handed her friend over to the feds who've done a sting. And during this time, Linda goes and walks around the mall shopping. Right. <laughs> you know, she, that, she could, that she's able to disengage so completely with the chaos she's just created. Right. And, and, and the shopping. other interesting fact is it turned out Susan Carpenter McMillan was in the same mall shopping for a suit for Paula Jones for her deposition. Yes, so. and meanwhile, the, 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 the prosecutors let Monica leave the room, and she goes and walks around the mall looking for a payphone to call Betty Curry and runs into Linda Tripp. Right. I, believe me, folks, you, can't you could make it not up. have made it up in your wildest <laughs> imagination if you had tried. But So Linda Tripp is working outside Vince Foster's office, working as a secretary. He dies. 
Did she find the note? I can't remember whether you no, said no. she that didn't find the, the note. No, that else. was uh, another employee who found the ripped up uh, note where Vince Foster talked right, about right. being eaten alive in Washington. Yeah. She's a zealot like character, Linda Tripp, which is why I wondered. So um, does she get moved from the Pentagon? No, she's still at the White House when Monica then comes in. No, uh, well, when Monica, she meets Monica after she is transferred out of the Pentagon. Oh, so they meet because, at the Pentagon, yes, that's she right. she was okay. making noise about the Vince Foster uh, matter and everything. And then Monica is transferred out because, of course, there's a re-election well, coming. And it's not good to have her around yeah. the White House. Yeah. yeah. So they end up at the Pentagon together. Yeah. And But now, not to jump entirely over the... Uh, uh, affair that Monica and Bill had, but I think that's the thing most people know the most about. Right. What I what I think is interesting is um, the part of the book that I mean, it could just be a standalone movie on its own. Is that day at the Pentagon Ritz? Right. Um, you've got Monica and and Linda working together at the Pentagon, and and Monica has been sharing her her innermost secrets with Linda. And Linda's going and telling everybody about it. I mean, she's, she's taking this information and creating havoc. Right? Well, she isn't telling everyone. Well, she's everyone going to she Ken shouldn't Starr's be telling. Prosecutors. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, she's telling all of them. And um, the, sting got, the, the sting got planned and pushed ahead because Michael Isikoff calls up. And um, talk about Michael Isikoff's role in all this because it would all have gone down differently if he hadn't, uh, you know, whoever, well, I guess Linda or Lucianne Goldberg was going to him, right? Yeah, well, perhaps it would have gone down differently because there are so many pieces of this mm -hmm. that you just can't figure out. Um, Michael Isikoff, who had been covering the Paula Jones case uh, from even before he was at Newsweek when he was at the Washington Post, has the, he has the information from Linda Tripp and he finds out that Ken Starr's office is getting involved in this case. And so he calls Jackie Bennett, the lead star prosecutor, and tells him that he has this information and that he is going to have to do his due diligence and contact Monica Lewinsky and Vernon Jordan and others and get a corroboration or not a corroboration unless they essentially strike a deal with right. him that he's going to get an exclusive. Now, and, and let me say, this is what aggressive journalists do, so there's no... Oh, he had a story. Yeah, he had a, a great I, story. I, I, was, I was impressed that when they asked him to wait, he said, okay, we're a News Weekly, I can give you two or three days. Well, this is where there's this unholy alliance because the waiting the three days was critical because Bill Clinton was about to testify three days later on Saturday. And so the whole oh, point every, here... Everything, all yeah. the pressure was coming but, down to bear. But here's the interesting point that a number of judges and others pointed out to me that I think has been overlooked. Stop and think about it. This was, I believe, where the train wreck occurred, where Ken Starr allowed his prosecutors to expand here. Because why is it that prosecutors should keep the president from telling the truth at a deposition? That's what the, the game became at this point, to keep... Michael is a cop from doing this so that the information was not known to Clinton and he did not tell the truth Isn't in his that, deposition. Like in a, in a normal court of law, wouldn't that be discovery? Well, it's called I mean, a perjury trap for some right, people. Right, but wouldn't there, yeah, I mean, everything, and everything was hinging on Monica. Right. What they were hoping is that they could get Monica in there with, with, uh, I don't know, the element of surprise, I guess. And, right, but it, had Breaker? Michael Isikoff published that story, Carol, I think, or called Monica and Vernon Jordan, they would have told President Clinton his testimony would have been much different in the Paul Well, this Jones is one case. of the central issues of your story. What if, what if Monica had been allowed to call her lawyer? Right. Which the prosecu prosecutors wouldn't let her do. Well, uh, wouldn't let is a little strong. They okay. strongly discouraged her from calling Frank Carter, who was her lawyer who But drafted. given that she's not a sophisticated person right. and was, you know, scared to the point of blubbering and thinking of jumping out a window, right? when, when you're discouraging a, a, a lay person like that from calling their lawyer, that can be construed as, I can't do it. Because at the same time, they're threatening her with, what, 27 years? Yes, prison. there was some discrepancy about how long, but it was going to prison. Hey, over, over a day. Right. <laughs> you know, all she's, you know, in her mind, she knew that there was the potential for bad blowback for having an affair with the president, 
But here she is sitting in this hotel room with people she do doesn't know who are saying, you know, we're ready to throw the book at right. you. Right, and that's where I think people should appreciate that some folks will say, well, Monica Lewinsky did this knowingly. She had this coming to her. She wanted the attention. It's a big difference between knowing that you have engaged in an affair with a married man who happens to be the president, and she's not incidentally the first young woman in the history of mankind who has no. made the mistake of having an affair with a married man, and knowing that that may become known to the public and on newspapers and whatever, and being put in that room and surrounded by prosecutors and saying you may go to jail and the president may be impeached. That's you, why she was thinking of jumping out the window. You spent a lot of time with modern day Monica. Um, what was your measure of her now? Is, is she over? I mean, she doesn't, is she still in love with Bill Clinton? Oh, I wouldn't say so. Uh, you know, we, well, those we, things can linger sometimes. Well, um, yeah, I, I think, in fact, in the last chapter... You can call a guy a big creep and still carry a flame. Oh, sure. Well, I think while this story was taking place, a number of key figures who were close to her confirmed that they believe she was still in love with him. I don't think there's any question. But now, um, I think that this has been just a devastating experience for her and her family. And one of the things she did tell me that I have in the last chapter is that um, she said she, looking back on it, one of the greatest disappointments is that Bill Clinton was not the person she thought he was, and that. Um, he, he never really reached out to make sure she was okay after all of this. To this day. Right. Of course, it's very complicated for anyone in a situation like this. Well, what so did it, what, I think her father makes an interesting point. What did her defense cost him? He implies that it cost $2 million. him $2 million. Right. And uh, he, he has quite a chip on his shoulder, not only that Clinton didn't apologize, but that he didn't say, here, let me help out with... Um, what this has cost you. Right. Of course, you do have to put yourself back at that time in President Clinton's shoes that any admission or reaching out yeah. to anyone could land you, uh, have right. you indicted and land you in passed. jail. So here you are. You're doing interviews with Monica Lewinsky. You're doing interviews with Bill Clinton. You're doing interviews with Ken Starr. Are you telling contemporaneously Bill Clinton what Ken Starr is saying to you? Are you telling Monica what Bill Clinton's saying to you and vice versa as you're doing your conversations? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. What kind and, of reaction are you getting? Well, that was a very important device. I was talking to some folks before lunch. As a writer, one of the things that you'll see is different about this book that you don't think of consciously is it moves so quickly because there's so much dialogue, because it's all of the people mm -hmm. talking themselves. That reads more like a novel than just uh, the third person sort but of account. But it was moving fast, even oh, sure. in real time. Right, it, it was. But one of the devices I was able to use with this dialogue is I could say, uh, talk to Ken Starr and say, well, do you think it was worthwhile? You didn't uh, end up uh, you know, convicting right. the president. And he would say, well, at least I feel we cleaned up a state. We did get some convictions. We cleaned up the state of Arkansas. Well, I said that to President Clinton, and he nearly went through the roof and said, clean up the state of Arkansas. That's not his job. You could send a special prosecutor into any state and find things there. So yes, you could get them talking back and forth with each other. Well, from the very beginning of the book, you've got the chief of the Justice Department's criminal division saying it's not his job to be a special prosecutor, that he doesn't have the resume for the job. Right. Well, um, can... And he, in a way, says the same thing to you. Uh, he, he says that he never should have, what was his word, expanded into Monica? That yeah, Ken Starr, who I talked with uh, extensively and I think is just a wonderful person, and again, you can create these one-dimensional caricatures where you have good guy and bad guy. I don't see it that way, and frankly, I did not find evidence of him being a partisan zealot hitman out to bring down the president during that whole whitewater investigation. He was slow, but he did tell me that he, if he had it to do over again, he would not have expanded into the Monica Lewinsky case. He would have left that for someone else, and that would have been better. Did you get a sense that Monica wanted you to send a message to Bill, or Bill wanted you to send a message to Monica, or, or Ken? To, I mean, did, were there any notes passed as you were uh, doing I was interview? not uh, at least consciously playing post office here.
But there Carol. had to be some element of that. I mean, these are all people, not one of whom has talked to the other since they had their intersections in history. My assessment is that they were playing for history here. And I have to say, I give them all credit. Bill Clinton knew because I told him that this was not going to be a book where I came in and bashed Ken Starr and treated him like a person with horns coming out of his head. He knew that, mm -hmm. but he still chose to cooperate. And Ken Starr knew that I had written op-eds that were generally favorable to President Clinton saying this was not an impeachable offense. He knew that. They were both interested in trying to have the story done correctly for history, and I think that was their focus. Um, the pro did all the prose prosecutors talk to you who were involved in the Monica Sting? Uh, just about. There were one or two who just had made a blanket decision to talk to no one. But uh, frankly, the best decision I ever made was to go to Ken Starr first, even though I had written some pro-Clinton sorts of mm -hmm. op-eds, and to reach out to him. He agreed to cooperate, and cooperated, gave me documents, his own, you yeah. see, uh, sprinkled in there, letters to his children at the time. It was a very painful yes. time for him. And you talked to his wife. Yeah, I wanted to personalize this you for do. all of the characters. Um, but I, I do think that uh, he ended up feeling that this was, uh, you know, something that he was called to duty to do, but it was a no-win situation at the end. Every, would you say everybody's life was, uh, if not destroyed, damaged by it? Seriously? Yeah, there, there were bodies littered across the road everywhere. I mean, Judith I mean nobody Google came out a prison. winner. Yeah. Um, President Clinton is, uh, you know, impeached in the House and has this dragging, this, you know, this whole series of scandals. The Republicans in the House are damaged? Yes, the, the House managers, Henry mm -hmm. Hyde, who I uh, interviewed, and he was a, a really genuinely nice, interesting fellow. But everyone, and Ken Starr's reputation, he had been at the peak of his profession, uh, had been tarnished. And uh, there were only a few people who I think really, when you look at it, uh, stuck to the rules as they should be. Judge Susan Weber Wright, who stayed out of it as people were messing with her case, in essence, the Paula Jones case. And when everyone got done with all of this stuff, stepped in and did what she would do to any yeah. litigant and, and held him in civil contempt. She's just one, she's just one of, of several junctures in the story that if something had just gone different by a degree, everything would have been different. Right. I felt that especially, what if Monica Lewinsky had reached Betty Curry on the phone right. when she's racing around the shopping mall insanely looking for a, a pay phone. And um, uh, yeah, fate, cons fate conspired. And in Judge this case. Wright's uh, opinion at the very end, if that had come out, you know, and, it, and what if she, you know, she made a decision not to find him? What was it in, in criminal, criminal contempt. contempt? And that was a new revelation here, and I can't reveal my sources, but I did confirm that she seriously considered during the impeachment, and this is a point that people miss all the time. During the impeachment, she considered finding President Clinton in criminal contempt for his lying in the Paula Jones case. If she had done that, the Senate would have had what it never had, which was a finding of a crime by a judge. Ken Starr's operation swooped in so early, ironically, that Judge Susan Weber Wright never got to decide if there was perjury here, because lying even under oath isn't always perjury. It's, a, you know, it's up yeah. to a judge to decide that in the context. Were there any heroes in this story? Yeah, ultimately, as I said, Judge Susan Weber Wright really stayed out of politics. Chief Justice Rehnquist, I give high marks to in terms of handling the impeachment trial that could have been a disaster. Even though people thought when they put when he put the braid on his robes that that was some yeah, kind of code, some secret signal. But it, it was that he had gone to a Gilbert and Sullivan right. play and saw that which and is, liked it, which is still a little weird, but you know, but not code. Yeah, and ultimately, to me, the hero here was the American public because when you stop and think about it. This thing just, it was a lack of restraint on both sides, fighting to the death. And finally, the American public said, we get it. We understand what happened here. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. Enough. Stop it. And that's when, really, the impeachment came to a halt. What, what, another person that is potentially a hero would be, was it jo Joanne Harris? Joanne Harris. Uh, this is the woman who was head of the criminal division. Now I think she's a private lawyer. Right. But um, she seems to be appalled all the way through. 
and, and, and often for very good reasons, but especially when she's assigned to do a report to study what, I guess specifically, well, generally the whole... Uh, the sting. The whole, st but was it just that or was it the yes. whole independent counsel operation? No, there were many, many complaints lodged against the Office of in Independent Counsel right. that the Justice Department had to deal with. And they narrowed it down to really the sting of Monica Lewinsky being the one that really did require an investigation of the investigators. And so Robert Ray, who succeeded Ken Starr as special prosecutor, right. appointed Joanne Harris, the former head of the criminal division, to conduct that secret investigation that has not been made public, really, the results of it until now in this book. And Joanne Harris talked to me that report is still under seal. So it's under seal, but she agreed to tell you the contents. She did agree because she felt the American public... Did that put public, her in any jeopardy? Well, I, I hope not. I think she felt that the public deserved to know this. We know everything else about every intimate detail of everyone in this story, except how she concluded the star prosecutors behaved in this. Do you think we know conclusively what the relationship was between Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky? Uh, do, you, do you have some, know something I don't, It's not Carol? possible, is it? <laughs> well, talking to her all these years later, um, do you get a sense of if she's always told the truth? Monica Lewinsky? Yeah. Oh, she's been extremely candid. Yeah. But has she told the truth? Well, in her affidavit, she obviously said that she did not have a sexual relationship, and that obviously was not a true statement, uh, which created all this trouble. But has she told the truth about the other details of the relationship and everything? Yes, I believe so. You know, I have to say that she's one person, and she's extremely smart, let me tell you, and extremely poised. Is she somewhere. happy? I don't know. She's certainly not happy about this piece of her but, life. But, I mean, has she made peace in her life, do you think? I, I don't, I frankly have made it a point not to pry into her personal life because she's so guarded with that in terms of what she's doing now specifically. Right. Uh, I know. Did you see her in her home? I, I saw her at her mother's home, yes, okay. in New York. And, uh, and then we had a series of conversations and over a period of seven years would, would do little updated conversations. Were you surprised that she was so willing to talk to you? Oh, she wasn't at first. Oh. Uh, you know, How'd I, you make that happen? Well, I talked to her, one of her lawyers, Plato Kacharis, mm -hmm. and he was familiar with the Archibald Cox book. As you know, Washington is a very small town. People don't realize this. And many of yes, the folks is. who ha were involved in some fashion in the whole Clinton yeah. saga had played some roles in Watergate, knew about my book, thought it had been fair. So he really advised her this was the person to talk to. Uh, but it took me a long time to gain her trust. She had obviously been burned by lots and lots of people, and she has uh, assiduously avoided the limelight, and I think, very honestly, the release of this book is very painful to her. Have you talked to her since it's been out? Oh, let's just say I talked to her around this time because I thought it was important for her to know um, what was going to be in it, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I do think Did you send galleys to the principal people who talked to you? Boy, you're really getting down to the nitty-gritty. Um, <laughs> I, I, I did, um, just because I thought it was only fair for people to be prepared. Yeah. Did any of them come back to you and say, can you change this or change Well, this? Um, and, so, and let me re revise that. I either sent galleys or advanced copies mm -hmm. of the book when it was already in print. Yeah. And so uh, when it's already well, in it, print, it's you can take out print. your pen and deal. mark it up. Yeah. But uh, for the most part, I was very scrupulous about any... Uh, I did allow people throughout the process, I would do transcribed interviews, send them copies of the transcripts. This was supposed to reflect the truth, the yeah. accurate, uh, you know, events. And so if anyone told me I had something wrong, I would change it. But I would never change something that was my interpretation, right. something other than facts. And uh, I, I stuck to my guns on that. I, I would imagine, given the comprehensive range of everybody you talk to, that for a, lo for a lot of them, I mean, there's no way we can know, that they don't plan to talk like this again, or right. if somebody comes to them again and wants to talk to all of them, they'll say, well, we talked to Ken, and, and there it is. Um, you keep mentioning Watergate. I think it's interesting, one of the parallels you drew in there, of, uh, with Nixon at the height of his crisis, right. and, and Clinton with the height of his crisis, and the way the two presidents 
did and didn't deal at this moment, and especially the way um, Clinton's staff looked back at Nixon and Watergate and, and sort of made a plan to help it, him not obsess about it. Yeah, um, there was a conscious decision by President Clinton's advisors not to allow him to uh, be done in by the forces that did in Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon, if you remember, became consumed by Watergate and became- As were all the people around him. Yeah, and the people around him and was eaten alive by it. Um, President Clinton, on the other hand, his staff kept, uh, created what they called a parallel universe to him to, for him to walk in every day where this didn't even exist uh, it, and, it, until it was time for him to prepare for some court proceeding right. or whatever. And he, of course, was a master at being able to block these things out. And you have to admit, I mean, regardless of whether you're a fan or a detractor of President Bill Clinton, the remarkable ability to function at this high level Here's a guy who comes in at, while the Senate is sitting in, in, in his impeachment trial and members of the House are trying to impeach him. And comes and back to the same room and gives the State of the gives Union. Gives the State of the <laughs> Union to those people yeah. who are by day trying to impeach him and gives the best State of the Union address in his career. It's just remarkable. I think I'd fall over. You have an anecdote, too, about somebody who's doing something with him. I don't remember. I don't remember. Was riding in a car with him or working on some project with him? Who was Richard just... Richard Clark. Right. How he was able to just so categorically focus and have blinders on to everything else. And tell a little off-color joke in the meantime. Right. But at the mean, in the meantime, at this same stage, you have Ken Starr just sort of on the edge you know you talk about how his wife's worried about how weary he's getting that it's it's re it's really beating him down which was an interesting contrast i thought between the two men yeah it, it was and again that's why it is a, a sad story um i did get ken Starr's correspondence at this time and he, he had a, an elderly mother mm -hmm. uh who was um sick in texas and he would like a any good dutiful son clip out newspaper clippings that said he was doing a good job and send them to his mom and say, don't worry. He's looking worry. everywhere to yeah. find those, right? Yeah. Now, well, don't forget, half of the country I felt know. very I strongly know. in both directions. My first interview with Ken Starr at the Army Navy Club here in Washington, I can't tell you how many former generals and others came up and shook his hand and said, thank you, you're a great American. So don't forget yeah. that at the time, the country was evenly divided on this. Where is he now? Ken Starr is the dean at Pepperdine Law School and was just named the president, the new president of Baylor University in mm -hmm. Texas. And I think he'll be a fabulous university president. So he president. lives? He lives in California, California right now and will be moving to Texas. He has no, no base in Washington anymore. Well, he does continue to argue select major cases, in, including in the United mm -hmm. States Supreme Court. He's one of the great um, Supreme Court advocates in modern times and has handled some big cases. And, and some involving, for instance, uh, you know, trying to prevent the death penalty in one case. So yeah. he's a very interesting uh, person and, and really was vilified in a way that I do believe was unfair in this, even though he did make some mistakes. There's no question about it. Um, here you are, an expert on the special prosecutor's office. I mean, you did the book on Archibald Cox. You've done this book. Um, tell me, what, where is the law on special prosecutors today? Has it been altered at all in light of these events? Oh, yes. Um, I was one of the last human beings in the country to testify in the Senate in 1999 that we should continue the independent counsel law in some fashion but revise it. By that point, the whole country, Carol, was so weary of this. Mm -hmm. Both parties, both D's and R's, decided We've had enough, and so the independent counsel law was a, ro a law that would sunset periodically, and it was coming mm -hmm. to its expiration term, and so the Congress just let it die, and that was the end of it. But it's not that we don't have special prosecutors. We shifted to a different model where they are created by the Justice Department itself with a, a little 
kind of wall built so that the attorney general is it's not- It's an important role, right? Yeah, uh, let's put it this way. We can be sure that at some time in the future, there will be another crisis, another scandal at the top of the executive pyramid. So do you, as Archibald Cox and Elliot Richardson did, write up rules on cocktail napkins to try to figure out how you set it up? Or do you do it in advance and try to have some semblance of rationality to addressing these so that the public can have confidence in the system? Uh, what, what, did, what did we, what did, I mean, what went right and what went wrong? I think we know what went wrong. What, what went right? What went right? That's a much tougher question because it is a tragic story where I believe both sides failed to exercise restraint in a way that people like Archibald Cox and Elliot Richardson did where they sealed themselves off from their own staffs mm -hmm. to do the right thing. And um, I, I think the only thing that went right in this whole thing, again, was that in the end, the American public uh, found the right balance in all of this. I think in the end, we did learn again that it's not a good thing even if you're president, to lie in a deposition, even if someone's trying to uh, put you in a box with difficult questions you don't have to answer, you can take a default judgment yeah. or whatever. Uh, so there are rules that do govern us. But I think we also learn that prosecutors, the most important job of a very effective prosecutor is knowing when not to exercise pro power knowing that even though you can That's tough one, though. yeah you can subpoena someone's mother mm -hmm. maybe you shouldn't subpoena someone's mother and so when you look in a mirror at the end of this story i think it tells us that we all share part of the blame and if we're going to get past that in our current climate in washington where yeah. we still have the red states and the blue states we all have to own up to the fact that we aren't at our best as a country when we're at each other's throats do you think there should be a special prosecutor named to investigate how the economic meltdown was handled by the government? How the economic meltdown was handled by the government? Well, obviously, when you have special prosecutors, it is generally the crime's already been committed. You, you have to, you know, have established a you know good basis for saying that there's a crime, and you have to know. Some people think that there has. Been. Well, but you can do that with the Justice Just about, Department yeah. itself. You don't yeah. necessarily need a special prosecutor. That was one of the problems: is special prosecutors are designed for very rare instances. Often, in most cases, we can use our existing. There'll system. be another, don't you think? Another special. Well, prosecutor. we've had we've had Watergate. And then we had Clinton and Lewinsky. We had the Scooter Libby case. Us, Don't yeah. forget, we had a special prosecutor in Not that. Not quite as... Not as dramatic. Right. Oh, sure. We, we will never escape these kinds of dramas in our history. There's no question. We just no handle question. each one differently. We handle each one differently. And that's the hope, is you study these things and you look back on it. And don't forget that as we are running around literally consumed by this as a country. And I mean, most people in the country, we now know, and for instance, I reveal in the book that there was an assassination attempt on President Clinton in the Philippines, and it turned out to be none other than a little known terrorist, Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. And that's what was going on in the background. You can now see looking back in time mm -hmm. as we're running around interviewing. Yeah, it's very interesting the way you weave uh, bin Laden and Saddam Hussein right. into the story. Well, it's, uh, I think all that's left is for people to get the book and read it because <laughs> we, uh, we've, only, we've only skimmed the surface because it, it is fascinating. It's page turner. I don't, know, I don't know how you follow this up. I guess we just have to wait for another big scandal. Along Hopefully it won't involve anyone in this room. So. Hopefully not. But um, thank you. Good luck. And thank you very much, Carol. Thanks for much, the Q &A Carol. Cafe. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.